Well, hello there, children of the Father's house, holy children, brethren in Christ because of the Holy Spirit that begets us into his family. The other day, I went to fill up my SUV and with petrol, with gas. I might say petrol from time to time, you guys here in America, because in the rest of the world, gas could be carbonated water. You ask for water with gas in Italy, for example. So anyway, so it came to $94. It would be probably $100 if I were to do the same thing today. And it wasn't even fully empty. So it would be a lot higher today. I've never had a gas bill that, that high. Inflation certainly is cutting into our, when we buy food, when we buy gas, when we buy anything right now, sometimes it's going up way higher than the eight or 9% average right now. It's going way, way higher. It's hitting us all very hard unless you're a millionaire. Now, why am I talking about that? And so I am Philip Shields. I'm host of this website, Light on the Rock, and where we focus on God, our Father, and Yeshua, the rock and the light of the world. And he comes into us so we can be lights of the world by him, by shining him out of us. Not just reflecting him, but him coming into us. And we become the light of the world, as Matthew 5 says. You are the light of the world. So it's not just a reflection. It's a true light that we have Christ in us. And so anyway, I, I felt like really focusing on Pentecost. It's coming up in a week or so, a couple of weeks. And I just felt like, you know, I need to focus on that. But this is really heavy on my heart that I need to get this out because time is of the essence. Time is of the essence. So it's a vital prophecy update. I'm going to focus on one or two things. Um, I suggest if you haven't seen the videos on Are We at the End of the Age, parts one and two, listen to at least part two. And I also had a sermon last fall, I believe it was, When Will Christ Return? According to what Yeshua himself said, has to happen before he appears visually to all of us in the clouds of heaven. So these are things he himself said. I'm certainly getting much closer to his return than we ever have before. So today I'm going to cover how important is prophecy, because I find people are two, two extremes on that. How close are we to Christ's return? Is worldwide famine already happening? And is it going to get worse? Will it come to America and to your country? How many of the seals, the six seals of Revelation 6, then we have a seventh seal in Revelation 7, how many of those seals have already started, been opened? What would be your top priority and focus right now? And then after that, what would be? The world's in chaos. Who did it? Who's causing the chaos? Is it Satan? Is it God? Is it ourselves? Find out what God himself says. You'll be surprised. So listen to this to the end, and, and you'll hear all of that and watch all of that. We'll cover all of that and more today. Let's briefly talk about prophecy itself. I find people are of two extremes on this. One extreme says, I don't want any of it because I can't understand it. And therefore, it's, it's a waste of time to go into it at all. The other extreme is, I want prophecy, prophecy, prophecy. That's all I want. I don't want to hear about love and grace and faith and, and loving your, your neighbor. I, I don't want to hear about those. I want to hear about prophecy. And so, yeah, bring those two together. Come to the middle. That's probably about right. Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ is the way the book of Revelation begins. It's not the revelation of John. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And look what he says in Revelation 1 verse 3. Blessed is he, blessed, happy, blessed is he or she, we might say today, who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things written in it for time is near. The time is near. Yeshua blesses you. Jesus wants you to read the prophecies of this book, and he warns you not to add to it. He warns you not to change it. Yeshua blesses you for reading and studying prophecy. We must not be like the world that wants more and more and more news on what's happening with uh, is it Johnny Depp and, and Heard in their trial against each other. Uh, we don't care about Will Smith slapping Chris Rock. Those are things the world, wa the world wants to hear about, it seems like. Not us. Not us. There's so much that we, we need to know. Uh, so we do, though, have a quandary as believers. I find that we're in a quandary as believers. 
in that um, we don't like we don't like thinking it's going to take too much longer for Christ to get here. We do want to pray thy kingdom come. We are praying thy kingdom come. But at the same time, I find that we find ourselves apprehensive. How bad is it going to really be? And are we ready for it? What do I have to do to get ready? So it's just like those who say that they believe when they die, they're going to go straight to heaven and see Jesus, but they're in no big hurry to die. So it's kind of like that. So children of the highest, we can't have it both ways. We can't be praying, thy kingdom come, please hurry, please send Yeshua back, and then at the same time, be apprehensive about the tough times that precede his coming. Look at Luke 21 with me. Luke 21, verses 25 to 28. Luke 21 is a parallel uh, chapter to Matthew 24. <clears throat> Yeshua tells us when you see these things happening, hey, look up. He says, there will be signs in the sun. Luke 21, 25 right now. Luke 21, 25. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, the stars, and on earth distress of nations with perplexity distress of nations, the sea and the waves roaring, tsunamis and all of that, uh, men's hearts, people dying from heart attacks and strokes and things, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. After all those things happen, then you see, now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. So we see the fear and the perplexity. We must be of people who understand this has to come first. In my last prophecy sermon, I did mention that I think there could be a possibility that Jesus Christ could be landing on the Mount of Olives as early as the fall of 2030 or 2031, uh, there's been a lot happening, and I said a lot has to be happening in the next year, two or three, especially, for that to be able to come about. And it seemed like for a while, okay, it, it, took, a, it took a quiet period for a couple months, but now again, things seem to be happening quickly, powerfully. So somewhere between 2030 and I think 2048, which is 100 years, from the start of the country called Israel in the Middle East. He said, watch the fig tree, a symbolic of Israel. There has been no fig tree for most of 2,000 years. There's been no Israel. In 1948, there was Israel again, the Israel called, Ju you know, the tribe of Judah. Judah, Levi, and Benjamin were, were Israel. I mean, were Judah. And so now there is. Now, it depends on what you, your definition of generation is. I think it can be as long as 100 years. If you look at what God said to Abraham, your children will come back here 400 years from now in the fourth generation, Genesis 15. Or it could be as low as 20 years. Other signs show it could be 40 years. So whatever generation means. So what's our first priority? To be getting ready for the return of Yeshua. First priority is make sure he knows you. Make sure you know him. Make sure you love him. If you love me, keep my commandments. He tells us, John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. And John 15, I think it's around verse 10, 11, he says, um, you know, if, if you love me, you will abide in my commandments, just as I abide in my Father's commandments and my Father's love abides in me, and so on. Ask God to open your heart and your mind to loving His way, to loving Him. I don't mean just loving His law. I don't mean just loving His kingdom, loving His way. I mean loving Him and being in love. In love. If you thought of it that way? Being in love with the one you're going to marry. Can you imagine marrying someone you're not in love with? We men have a harder time picturing being in love with Yeshua, with Jesus. But I know the more that I grow in my relationship with him, and I go for my walks, I call my walk and talks with him, when I kneel by my bed, when I sit out in the lanai at midnight in the dark, and I hear the crickets and all of that, 
and I just speak with my God in heaven and the one I'm going to marry. I hope I'm part of the bride. And I feel a great love. And then when I fail him and when I sin, I feel like I've let him down. And don't, don't think you can't pray to Jesus. I mean, can you imagine not talking to the person you're going to marry, just talking to his father and not to him? Stephen talked to him. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit or something like this. Don't lay this sin to their charge. Don't charge them with this sin. John prayed to Jesus, the last part of the very end of Revelation 22. And there are other examples. So we adore Jesus. We just can't stop talking about him the more we adore him. We just can't. We love him. And we're in love with him. Be sure that as you love him, you're doing things that are pleasing to him. You're walking in his path. You're not upsetting him. We must be strengthening our relationships with God our Father and Yeshua is what I say the first priority is. Because <clears throat> you don't know if your next moment is going to be waking up from death. You had a heart attack. You had a car crash. You had something happen. Could be me. Could be you. So make sure you are close to him. Make sure you're putting him absolutely first in your life. Absolutely first in your life. Make sure that your lives out there, your life, depicts that relationship. That's your strongest sermon. That's the strongest telling that you can have. It's, it's, not, it's not the things that we say to other people, but when they watch our lives and they see, they see Jesus in us, they see the Holy Spirit in us, they ask you, how can you be so happy? And how can you be so much at peace? I remember when our son died and when we were at the Graveside, just my wife and I and the gravedigger. Because it was winter time in Canada. <clears throat> and uh, we, we just, uh, the man said, I've never seen a couple burying their child so much at peace. And I said, oh, believe me, there's a lot going on in my heart. But I know. I said, believe me, I'd just as soon be in there with him. But I know. I'll see him again. I might even get a chance to bring him up, to resurrect him. Maybe God will let me do that. And we have that belief. And Jesus is our resurrection. And because he was resurrected, we can have this peace. So anyway, we have to be obedient, submissive, seeking his will, living his will, repenting so deeply when we fail, as we all do from time to time, and having less and less of the big failings and more and more of an obedient life and um, I think those of us who seek him with all of our heart we are going to find that we have the greatest chance of not having to go through the great tribulation God already knows we'll be faithful to him if we're like the people of the Philadelphian group in Revelation 3 <clears throat> of that church and not like the Laodicean church I think they're fine that say they're blessed, they have everything going well, God must be happy with me, I'm so blessed. Watch for a blog I'm going to write out about are you blessed and are you a blessing. Blessings have so much more to do than money. <clears throat> Luke 21, 34 to 36. Take heed to yourself, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life. Cares of this life are the worries. Quit worrying. Worrying is a sin. It means you don't have faith in God. And then this carousing and drunkenness. Some of you I know love the happy hours. You love happy hours at the various bars you go to. Uh, be careful where your priorities are. And that day come upon you unexpectedly. It'll come as a, as a snare, a trap, suddenly. Remember the rat trap that I had? On all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. I even pray that God will count us worthy to escape. And I pray for many of you by name that he will count you worthy to escape. I don't want any of us to go through the great tribulation, a time of worst trouble the world's ever seen. But it does seem like some, like in Philadelphia, says I will keep you from the hour of trial coming upon the whole earth. 
So anyway, so seek him, ask to be delivered from the time of great trouble coming. Make sure you have a habit every day, starting the day with prayer. Seek you first the kingdom of God. I know this is basic stuff, but I also know we're not all doing it. I preach to myself too. If I get up there to 11 or 12 o'clock in the day and I haven't prayed yet, on my knees seeking him, then I say, come on, Philip, first thing in the day, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all the other things that we have to get done, all the other things we need from God will be supplied. Matthew 6, 33 says that. And also be studying his word. A lot of you, I know, you spend all your so-called Bible study just listening to sermons, teachings, including mine, which I appreciate. But I'm teaching you, you must be in the word itself. You must read verse by verse, chapter by chapter. So when you hear something that's true, you, you, you immediately can relate verses to it. If you hear something that's false, you can say, no, no, that's not what scripture says. Read verse by verse daily, just like you collect the manna. The bread from heaven was manna. They had to get up early in the day before it melted. They had to get up there and, 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 and get it in first thing in the day. You see what I'm saying? And manna represents God's word. So let me make a note of that because that's not in my notes. And it's like God's spirit was saying, Talk, tell them about manna, tell them about manna. It's kind of what I was hearing in here. Anyway. Uh, this means we have to be also effectively fighting sin. Whenever we have sin in our lives, uh, maybe make a short list or long list, whatever yours is, of things that you have kind of struggled with forever and ever and haven't ever really fully overcome. And start to overcome them, fight them, overcomers. Look at all the churches in Revelation chapter uh, 2 and 3. <clears throat> Just about all of them, God says, to, Jesus says to them, to the overcomers, to those of you who overcome, I will let you rule over the nations. To those of you who overcome, I'll give you the white stone saying you're, you're, you're safe. Or I'll let you see the manna and all that. I'll give you white garments, okay? It's time to overcome sins and weaknesses that have plagued us so many years. So at the end of this year, we can say, yes, I have overcome this and this and this. I have a new schedule. I am praying every day. I am not giving in to my lust. I am not flirting. I am not... Whatever it is, breaking the Sabbath, being too loosey-goosey on the Sabbath. I am not coveting like I, so much like I, would, like I was before. I don't have filthy words coming out of my mouth. I'm not over-drinking. Hopefully we can say that, that we are overcoming. What is it that's keeping you from shining brightly? I will say that if you're tolerating sins in your life, this is our first priority, get rid of that. If you're tolerating sins in your life, you are not walking and living in the presence of Almighty God. We can't be. He won't walk in, walk in sin. If you're watching things he wouldn't watch, turn it off. If you're going places he wouldn't go with you, then don't go. You see, it's that kind of thing. So the number one, get connected strongly as never before because time is short. And then put your trust in God. If you don't have money to buy, stock up on food and things like that, at least and most importantly have this connection with God and he can take care of you. Let me talk about that in just a minute. But also I want you to be concerned not just for yourself but also for the nation. In 2 Chronicles 7, we all know verse 14 that if my people called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face okay, and turn from their wicked ways. We all know that one. But let's start, let's get a running start in verse 12. Solomon had just dedicated the temple, and God liked it. And in 2 Chronicles 7, verse 12, Jehovah the Lord appeared to Solomon by night. Whether that's a vision or literally appeared, if he appeared, then that would be the one who became Yeshua, who became Jesus. Because no one has seen God the Father. Jesus himself said that. <clears throat> Yehovah appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer, I've chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. And when I shut up heaven, when I do it, when I shut up heaven, there's no rain, there's a drought, you're going to have famines. And I command the locusts to devour the land. Your food supply is going to be down or send pestilence. It's called pandemics, epidemics among the people. When I do that, 
Don't pray so much that the people all out there repent and seek him. We, the people of God, it says. Did you notice that? If my people, not Baal's people, if my people who are called by my name, Christian, Church of God, called by my name, Messianic, whatever, you know, will humble themselves, humble themselves, if my people would humble themselves. That means fasting too. And pray and seek me, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Like I've been saying, we have to start overcoming. Much more than we ever have. Turn from their wicked ways. What wicked ways are you tolerating? You've got to turn from it, brethren. You've got to turn from it. So do I. And I have on so many things. There's still some things I'm trying to turn from. Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Don't forget, some of you like to go to verses in Jeremiah and even John 17 and others where God says, don't pray for the world, pray for, you know. But Abraham prayed for Sodom. He never once brings up Lot's name. I'm sure that's what was on his mind in Genesis 18. But he said to God, to Jehovah, who had to be the one who became Jesus Christ, because no one has seen God the Father. That's why I always say that Jehovah can be either God the Father or the one who became Jesus Christ. We know which is being referred to by the context and which one is being seen. If it's being seen, it has to be Jesus Christ. I have two or three sermons going in depth on that. But anyway, Abraham prayed for God's mercy on Sodom. On Sodom! If there be ten righteous, will you destroy the whole city? If I find ten righteous in Sodom, I will not, God said. Jeremiah, he was even told, don't pray for these people. But what did he do? He wrote a whole book called Lamentations, which is a prayer for God's mercy on Judah, the house of Judah. And many times he begged God to not be so hard. Daniel, Daniel 9, go back and read his prayer. And his prayer is all about, we have done this. We have failed you. We have sinned. You see what I'm saying? We have done these things. Jeremiah even told, uh, told God, uh, told the Jews when they were going into Babylon that God had told them that they should pray. Look this up if you don't believe me. They should pray for the peace of Babylon. Pray for the peace of Babylon, for in it you shall have peace. Jeremiah 29, verses 4 to 7. Just look it up yourself, or if we have time, we might even stick it up here while I'm talking about it. Jeremiah 29, verses 4 to 7. Even though in his prayer, John 17, Jesus said, pray not for the world, what did he do on the cross? It probably was a cross, not just a stake, upright stake. Go back and hear my sermon on the cross. <clears throat> what did he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Which is exactly what, also what uh, uh, Stephen did when he was being killed. So let's be more like God himself, who loved the world so much, he sent his only eternal companion, the Word, down to die for all of us became the Son of God, and Paul prayed that his people, the, Jude, the Jews, would, would, would come to salvation too. He said, I'll even give up my own salvation if I could be assured that all Judah would be saved. I forget what chapter that's in now. I think it's Romans 9, but I don't know for sure. But remember, God was merciful to Nineveh because they did repent. They, they did listen to Jonah. The book of Jonah talks all about it. Jonah was disappointed that they repented. He wanted to see them blotted out. Nineveh, he knew, would be a coming to destroy uh, the house of Israel later on. So, anyway, so my point in all of this is most urgent right now is that we get reconnected to God, pray for the nation. Please do pray for the nation. God will like that. He will really like you doing that. And um, we have to turn from our wicked ways. We have to seek his face. Look at Amos 5, verses 14 and 15. <clears throat> Amos 5, verses 14 and 15. Seek good and not evil that you may live, so the Lord God of hosts will be with you as you have spoken. Hate evil, love good. Establish justice in the gate, that it may be that the Lord your God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. He's saying, look, turn things around in your lives, you who are my people, and I just might surprise you. So right now, 2 Chronicles 7, 15, Amos 5, Tell us what we need to be doing. So 
Study God's word. Seek it. Get into it. Pray to him daily. First thing, be overcoming. And after reconnecting with God and then seeking what he wants, then what? I firmly believe, I firmly believe that the first two seals of Revelation 6 definitely been opened. And seal number three is opening at this point. I don't think it's been open until now. But I think it's definitely open now or about to be open. Revelation 6 verses 5 and 6. Out of the NIV it says, When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature, the ones around God's throne, say, Come. And I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Rider riding, I was holding a pair of scales in his hand, and I heard what sounded like a voice from among the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat, that's about a loaf of bread, for a day's wages. Three quarts of barley for a day's wages. So it wasn't that there was no food at all, but it was scarce and therefore also very expensive. Um, inflation is being talked about here. What are we seeing around the world right now is inflation. What are we seeing around the world right now is scarcity of food, scarcity of petrol, of gas, oil, diesel, much scarcity. <clears throat> so anyway, right now, I think the next big thing you've got to do, and why I decided to talk about this instead of getting ready for Pentecost, I will have sermons on Pentecost. But if you can afford to do so, if you can't afford to do so, trust God with all your heart. If you can't afford to do so, can afford, still trust him with all your heart, but do your part also. Stock up right now while you can with food and vital supplies. Do it now. Don't wait till next week. Do it now. I'm talking about food with long shelf life, like beans and rice and lentils and canned foods. All right, we normally don't like to recommend canned foods. We, we know they'll stay viable for a while. And then also have your backup water. Uh, some of you will be in earthquake situations. The water supply could be turned off. And so I, I, I'm not saying prepare backup food for a year or two. I'm not. You have to trust God. But in the emergency situations that come up. So I have five, five gallons, five, five gallons of water uh, purified water that's always ready and I rotate them through and I use them up and I keep replacing them and beans and rice and lentils. You can go to something called um, My Patriot Supply and also to 4Patriot, the number, the digit 4. 4 Patriot. Uh, and when you, if you buy supplies from them, it'll be quite a bit. You'll have to have a place to store them. Don't put them in your attic. Don't put them someplace hot. Keep them in your house. They say that it has over 20, 25 years shelf life. So it might be good to get some of that. It's not cheap, but it might be good to get that. Also be preparing firewood if you, if you can have fire. Propane tanks for your grills. Have some extra toilet paper. You know how hard it was to find toilet paper for a while. The N95 mask. We're being told more pandemics are coming. I told you that. But the government is saying expect it. It's almost like what some people call plandemics. Like, it's almost like they're planning it. But anyway, make sure you have enough so you have sanitizers, you have gloves, you have masks. So if you do have to go out and required to wear those things, then you have it. Extra emergency fuel, extra petrol, extra gas, your medicines, dog and cat food. Stock up now. Be ready now. Be ready for troubling times now. Learn the lesson from Joseph. Remember Genesis 41. Genesis 41, he had, Pharaoh had this dream. Seven fat beautiful cows, followed by seven lean, ugly cows who ate the seven fat cows, and then also the grain and all that. In Genesis 41, go back and read the story if you're not familiar with it. And Joseph said, God says, you're going to have seven wonderful years of great production, and then seven years of severe famine. So what we need to do is save as much of the grain, the wheat, the corn. I don't know if they had corn there, but anyway, the wheat, the barley, and whatever else that we can save up, let's save it up as much as we can. And that's what they did. What did they do though? They shared it with the rest of the world. The world had to buy it, but they shared it with the rest of the world. So as you stock up and save, keep in mind, this is not just for you and your family. If a neighbor comes by or a family member comes by and says, we are all out of food, 
do you by any chance have one or two or three cans of food that I can have? I'll buy them from you. I'll Please help me. I'm starving. I haven't eaten for two or three days. And you say, oh my, of course. And you give them two or three cans. I don't know if you give them your whole supply, but you share what you have. And that's what the widow of Zarephath did in 1 Kings 17 during the famine of Elijah's day that Elijah called down on them after the ravens quit feeding him. Go back and read the story in 1 Kings 17 if you're not familiar with it. Uh, God said, go to, go to Sidon, where, which is the home country for Jezebel. <laughs> and imagine the faith. Go right into the backyard of Jezebel, Zarephath. There'll be a widow there who will take care of you. So he finds this widow collecting sticks and she says, oh, I have just enough flour and oil for my son and I to have one more piece of bread and then we're going to die. And Elijah says, you are to give that to me. And then cook what's available for you. Elijah already knew that, do what I'm saying, give me that bread and God will provide oil and flour for you until it starts raining again. So those of you who can't afford to stock up, pray that God, please let me be like the widow of Zarephath, <clears throat> that I knew I used up this bread or this meat or this rice or whatever. I go back tomorrow and hey, the bag of rice is still there, exactly unopened. Pray for that, okay? And she had to share her very last flour and oil with Elijah in 1 Kings 17. Now remember also the miracle of the loaves and fishes. If the boy, it came from a lad, it came from a boy, John 6 says, verses 9 to 14. If the boy had said, wait a minute, these five loaves and two, two fish here, are for, and little fish, are, are really for me and my buddies here, or me and my family here. No, that's not what he did. He gave it up. And from that sharing, look what happened. 5,000 people were filled up and baskets full left over. 12, was it? So remember this. With your food you've saved up, you'll be able to share, and you'll do so gladly. And ask God to bless you in prayer as you do so. And maybe the miracle of the widow's oil will happen. Maybe the miracle of the boy with the five loaves will happen. So stock up, though, now if you can't afford it, so you have something to share. Buy some spare gas cans of petrol. Buy extra propane, tank, propane tanks, like I've said. Lots of rice, beans, and so on. Maybe tortillas, <laughs> whatever you guys like to eat. Now, someone asked me when I was telling people on Facebook, please stock up. Someone asked me if I'm a prophet. No, I'm not. It's just common sense. So many ministers, so many economists, so many are saying that it's on the way. In Sri Lanka, the old Ceylon, you know, outside of India, their little island, they're having food and gas riots right now. The World Bank finally gave them some money to be able to buy some more petrol, some more oil, some more food, and they were having food riots. We're going to see food riots, I believe, in our country. British officials, in fact, are warning that there are coming severe shortages because of the war in Ukraine. Ukraine was called the breadbasket of Europe and for much of the world. They sent a lot of their corn and wheat and barley and so forth down to Lebanon, down to other parts of even Africa. In a little research I, I, I looked up, the country's suffering the most right now. Zimbabwe. Well, what they do in Zimbabwe? They've killed an awful lot of the white farmers and taken all their farms. I don't know if you know that or not. But anyway, they're the one most hard up, according to one source I looked at. Liberia, Syria, Nepal, Afghanistan, some Caribbean countries are really, really struggling. Now, I'll put uh, some pictures and things up as we're talking about these things. Ukraine, as it turns out, it was a major supplier of corn, wheat, and fertilizer. Uh, the war has almost completely shut down their ports and their ability to export. And also the Donbass, which is the uh, eastern part, the eastern part of Ukraine, was, is, is where all the war is going on. That's the richest part of their country as far as land and, and farming goes, and also for precious metals like titanium and so on. They have a lot of precious metals there. That's why Russia probably wants all that. And a lot of the people in the Donbass, the, east, the eastern part of, uh, of Ukraine, uh, speak Russian. 
And that's one reason the Ukrainians were so unprepared, even though, even though all these armies were massing up on the border. They said, no, we have so many friends and relatives in Russia. Surely they wouldn't come and attack us. But they did. So let me ask you, why are we having these fuel shortages? Why are we having that? I just got to make a note here. Um, Biden's war on fossil fuels, I think, has done more than anything to raise inflation. Because when you have to pay a lot more for diesel, diesel is what moves the trucks. The trucks are what move everything, food and oil and gas. And uh, I'm sorry, food and all supplies is what I'm trying to say. Uh, we don't need to have fossil fuel shortage. We don't. We have more than enough right here in America to not just take care of our needs, but supply Europe and much, much more. The very severe drought in the, in the U.S.'s southwest is also a big part of it. Skyrocketing cost of fertilizer. It's going to bring food costs way up and cause a shortage. Wars, wars everywhere, not just Ukraine. But you can't plant, you can't harvest. And then the armies will confiscate what the farmers have in food. That's happened for millennia. And then the something really strange is that we have all these food storage facilities and plants across America, big, huge places that store food, and they're being they're, ble they're, be they're, they're burning down one after the other. A strange fire starts. And several of them, five or six or seven of them, have been hit by planes. How likely is that? One of them, at least one of them, was a drone. No pilot, I mean, no, uh, no rider, no pilot, no person inside. But that drone was full of explosives, and somehow it landed on one of these food storage plants. You might not be hearing that in the news. I'm telling you, it's true. And uh, so why is that happening? Could it be that someone wants us to have food shortages for whatever reasons? Google it. I think you'll find it. Food storage plants on fire. If war and drought, calamity, it's any other major food producing country like Canada, America, China, Russia, Argentina, Germany, famine worldwide will be catastrophic. But I think already with the food I mean, with the uh, weather patterns the way they are, floods, hurricanes, droughts, the different tornadoes, all the different things happening, and then you add the shortages of fertilizer and shortages of fuel, uh, we're going to have a famine. And I believe this year or next. I believe this year you'll start seeing food shortages like you've never seen before, food prices. At least when you stock up now, listen, if you stock up now, you're buying them at today's prices. I know they're high, but they're going way, way higher. So stock up now what you can at the prices that you can pay for. So I'm not a prophet. I, I, I see that I listed a whole bunch of sites that talk about is there a food shortage coming and list of potential foods in short supply, planned food shortages. Um, now we're being told to expect food and diesel shortages. The government official warns of apocalyptic food shortages. These are all sites that I, I'll put in my notes. So the third seal of Revelation 6 is not just about famine, but scarcity with inflation. You can still buy bread, but it takes a day's wages to buy it. And skyrocketing inflation at that. So. So much of this goes back to our world leaders and especially Biden's decisions to not allow any oil, any further oil explanation and to make it difficult for the oil companies to want to be involved in this. Because he said over and over, I'm, I'm looking for a time and a year when we no longer have to rely on fossil fuels or coal or oil. And so they're saying, well, so why should we bother? And he has canceled some leases that he had given out just the other day it happened. And so, so much of that causes the skyrocketing inflation. You combine that with the other di disasters we have going on, these literally millions that are just pouring across the southern border or will cross. And so much of that has to do with President Biden's decision. He won't let us produce our own oil that we have. So what's he doing? He's buying it from Venezuela, buying it from Iran or Russia. This is so crazy. On last night's news, by the way, they even said that 
uh, in California, especially in other places where they rely so much now on solar panels. I even see ads now that, hey, don't worry about the cost of solar solar panels. If you if you get involved in it, the government will pay for it. OK, so whether that's true or not, a lot of places in California now are using solar panels and wind turbines. Well, the problem is when there's no wind or when there's not a lot, a lot of sun and you have to have a place to store what energy, a way to store what energy they do produce. The news last night was saying that uh, California now has less energy now than it did some years ago. The more green it goes, so solar power, uh, wind, uh, the less energy they actually have. Now, who did all this? Is this Satan's work? Who caused all this? Is it Biden's work? Yeah, it was. But I've said for many years that though God, of course, also sends the plagues and the locusts, as we read in Second Chronicles, he's going to be able to say, but you know what, though, a lot of what happened you guys did to yourself. Did you know there are verses that even say that? Certainly this oil and diesel and pet petrol shortage and the inflation that that causes, certainly that was totally avoidable. Totally avoidable. But President Biden wants to blame Putin. Nonsense. Inflation had already more than doubled. From the time he came into office to the time the war in Ukraine started, it had already doubled, more than doubled. And it's continuing to skyrocket up. It has more to do with his decisions about fossil fuels than anything else. Plus, we locked down most of the country for a couple of years. Businesses had to close. And um, it had a lot of after effects, these two years of lockdown. I'm so thankful to be in Florida where Governor DeSantis did, thought that was nuts. nuts. And by the way, uh, we kept going here in Florida. We didn't have to wear a mask everywhere we went unless the store required it, but the government didn't. And so, and yet our results from COVID were about the same as those that had all these lockdowns and everything else. People lost their jobs. They couldn't go see their doctor. They couldn't get their cancer treatment. Many, there were much higher suicides and depression in other states. So yeah, we did it to ourselves. Now let's read Jeremiah 2 verse 14. Let's look what God says. Jeremiah 2 14. Is Israel a servant? Are you a slave? Are you a homeborn slave? Why is he plundered? Why, why, why is everything going so badly for you, Israel? And I believe, remember, I've told you this many times, that Britain, American, Britain and America, or United States and Britain and Canada and Australia, that's the tribe of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, had two sons. And uh, they became known as Israel. Uh, Jacob put his name upon them, Genesis 48. You'll see that. But anyway, so he's saying, is America a servant? Is America a bunch of slaves? It's really what it, the way I read it. You can disagree with me if you want, but I'm saying America is not left out of the Bible. Britain's not left out. We're Israel of the Bible. The nation called Israel was really the house of Judah, the Jews. Anyway, Jerem and I'll show this sometime in a sermon. Jeremiah 2, verse 17 and 19. Have you not brought this on yourself? Have you not brought this on yourself in that you have forsaken the Lord your God when he led you in the way? I was walking with you and you guys walked away from me. You canceled me from the schools. You canceled me from governments. You canceled me from businesses. You tried to take down my Ten Commandments uh, uh, pillars and things that were in front of certain justices and, and courts. And you told, and, and you made it impossible for a, for a coach to pray with his team on the field. You walked away from me. You brought it on yourself. Verse 19, your own wickedness will correct you and your backslidings will rebuke you. Know therefore and see that it's an evil and bitter thing that you've forsaken Jehovah your God and the fear of me is not in you, says Jehovah God of hosts. Verse 17, Jeremiah 2, let's look at it. Have you not brought this on yourself? So, 
Besides that, make sure you stock up with vital supplies, dog food, cat food, paper, toilet paper, food, lentils, beans, rice, canned food, as much as you can, do it. Buy some extra petrol, gas. Other big problems are happening. The stage is being set around the world for the one world government. Also on the news recently, and I sent out a memo on this at least a week ago to a bunch of people, that the World Health Organization, WHO, WHO, is being set up right this weekend as I speak in Switzerland to bring one world governance and control and direction to all major health events. They will be able to tell you if you can fly or not. And I'm wondering, when did we allow that to happen? When did we let Congress vote on that? When did I have any say in that? And they're saying part of their deal is that they're going to shut down uh, disinformation about the health issues and pandemics which means that you can't say all of this is a fraud or, or it's overstated or people are, there are side effects of the shots. My own sister was paralyzed for four hours when she took, when she took her booster shot. Paralyzed for four hours. And lots and lots of people are having myocarditis, heart inflammation, blood clots, strokes. And a lot of people are dying way beyond what should be the number of people dying. So you, you, you think for yourself, but if you say anything like that, all of a sudden they can come after you. Where are they? <laughs> They're coming. So you watch, they'll try to force compliance in saying only what's approved for, by them to, for you to say. No more free speech unless we fight it like crazy. But sooner or later it's coming. And economics, stock market right now is plunging and could totally collapse by September. September 2022, October 2022, somewhere in there. It could just be a great collapse. I don't know if it will or not, but just be, be ready. It's already collapsing, not majorly, but on May 18, it plunged 1,165 points. The next day, May 19, it plunged, uh, I think it was, uh, I thought I had it in here, 237 points or something like that. And then last time I looked at it today, it was down 400 points. So I mean we're 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 looking we're looking at a collapse going on. Cryptocurrency had toppled, even silver pricing has dropped. Inflation is blowing people away. Recession is being discussed openly now, a coming depression perhaps. The numbers we're seeing in the stock market and inflation and all of that have not been seen since 1932. Is one report I heard, which is right about the Great Depression, right? The southern border. What border? We don't have a border. It's wide open. How many terrorists are coming in? How many drug dealers are coming in? How many people dealing with, with sex slaves? You know, all these unaccompanied minors? These six, seven, eight, nine, ten year olds and younger? Many of them are going into the sex business. Because that's the deal that was made by these gangsters in Mexico to help them get across. Biden's attempt to control free speech, food shortages, a crime wave, murders way up, rapes, thefts, robberies. In New York, they push people into the, onto the tracks of oncoming, uh, on, oncoming trains, subway and all that. People just go into, openly go into Walgreens, come out with, a, in California, as long as it's less than $950, you're okay. So they're doing it. Walgreens after Walgreens in San Francisco is having to shut down. Where is this heading? America is collapsing and it will collapse. So will Britain. So will Canada. Canada is even worse than America right now and what Trudeau is doing over there and allowing over there. It's a total train wreck. Freedom of speech is gone in Canada. And God says, you guys brought this on yourselves. Jeremiah 2.17. I think you'll start to see the WHO in complete control, like I said, of our health. I think you'll start to see what's called SMART, S-M-A-R-T, all capital letters, health cards coming that will have uh, all the information that you have, in fact, had this shot or when and what kind of shot it was and so on. Uh, that's coming. Just watch. And if you don't 
aren't able to produce certain things, at some time in the future you won't be able to fly. It's already that way in Canada. Anyway, we're watching that, the, what WHO is doing. We're watching Israel and Jerusalem. And we're watching any discussion about a temple and red heifers and all of that. I do believe there will be a temple. If there's going to be a temple, they got to get started here pretty soon. Iran and its nuclear aims and designs. The stage is certainly being set for Revelation 13 beast power. Russia, you know, even just six months ago, I'd be saying, where's Europe? Why is Germany not building their tanks and all of that? Why are they not willing to, because we were protecting Germany and the rest of Europe at our expense mostly, and that's what Trump was trying to stop. But when Russia invaded Ukraine, and so viciously, it kind of woke Europe out of their sleep. So now you have them building and making more armaments. Now you have Sweden and Finland who have been forever neutral, now asking to join NATO because if we get attacked, we know that all of you guys are, will help defend us. And if you get attacked, we will too. And Finland this time has 100,000 troops. I forget how many in Sweden, but they, Sweden's got the very latest aircraft, fighter aircraft and all of that. These are powerful additions to NATO which could some, then morph into eventually the beast power. We'll see. I mean, the most recent ones that applied for NATO were Montenegro. And uh, what was the other one? I, but but they, they can't contribute much. But Sweden and Finland def definitely can. Finland has an 800-mile border with Russia. So be watching these things. And now, guess what? Elon Musk, uh, he's brilliant. He's decided to build a super-powered tank, a lightweight tank that can move and adjust and, and, and be very flexible. Uh, but, to my disappointment in a way, he's doing it with Germany. I bet you haven't even heard that news. He's building a super tank with Germany. We're watching China and how it's gaining in military strength, gaining in their naval powers, all of those things. We're watching Russia. Russia is openly talking about how stupid UK is, the United Kingdom, for aiding Ukraine. Hey, we can wipe out your whole island in just minutes with our hypersonic ballistic missiles. Or by even sending them by our, we can, we can have one explode just off the, they said this, just off the west coast of Britain. And this mighty tsunami will come and roll over with radioactive wave all over the whole country. We've never talked that way before. It was always MAD, MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. So we're going to not talk about destroying each other. We'll have our supplies, we'll have our nuclear weapons, but we're not going to keep threatening each other. Russia's doing it. They threatened to attack Ukraine, they threatened to attack, attack Serbia, they uh, threatened to attack Georgia, not our state, but I mean the, the land mass over there uh, south of Russia, on the, on the west side of Russia. They did it. So all of this is happening. I think we're coming very close, very close. I don't think it's going to be any later in 2048, but I think it could well be 2030 or soon after. How close are we? Look at, in my two-part teachings, are we at the very end of the age? I speculated on 2030 and I explained why. And I read to you this passage. Remember 2 Peter 3.8, we can post that too, 2 Peter 3.8 says, a day with our Lord is as a thousand years, a thousand years as a day. So here, look at Hosea 6, verses 1 and 2. Christ, in about eight or nine years more from now, Jesus Christ will have died 2,000 years ago, come 2030 or 2031, whichever the year was. I believe it was 2030. But Jesus Christ will have died 2,000 years prior by the time we hit 2030. Hosea 6 verses 1 and 2 says, Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, he's, he's been hitting us, and he will heal, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. Let's return to him. It's like I read earlier. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, on the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. After two days, he will revive us and 
Is that talking the resurrection at the end of 2,000 years from Christ's time? Is the third day the beginning of the millennial reign of Christ? I think it might be. I think that's a fascinating passage. Hosea 6, 1 and 2. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up. So that passage is not clear enough to be absolutely certain he's coming 2030, but, but boy, be watching. Just be watching. I'm saying it, I'm putting it as speculation. I'm not a prophet. That Christ could be here in just eight or nine more years. And if not then, then probably no longer than 2048. I have 10 more pages of other key events coming, but let's call it a day there. So what should we do now? Seek God as never before. Repent. Turn from your wicked ways, you people of God. Be sure you're praying and studying every single day, which means you got to cut out time wasters in your life. Time wasters. I've cut way down on TV, even news. And I, I rely on Epoch Times and others, others that I can see headlines and, and keep moving. Seek God as never before. Read his Bible. Read his word. Get on your knees every day. Pray always. Turn from your wicked ways. Overcome things that have to be overcome. And then go out there and stock up. Stock up. I think we could well see a coming recession and depression and inflation, stagflation they call it, happening to us soon. Inflation will make the famine far worse. They call it food shortages. Use the Bible term, famine. It's coming. So get out there and stock up. No delay. Don't wait till next week. Be sure you're willing to share. As Joseph did, as the widow did, as the lad did with the five loaves and two fishes. But start stocking up. We just have as well. Keep watching for how the stage is being set. For all the other prophecies. For United Beast Power, which I think is going to be Europe. And then the other beast which comes up, which will be the false prophet. Then there's Babylon, the whore. I'll talk about Babylon, the whore, and all that in coming sermons. Um, I think it's been greatly misunderstood. Anyway, I'll leave it with that. Let's just ask God's blessing and dismissal now. Thank you for coming. Let other people know about us. We don't really have a good way of getting the word out. So please, if you like it and you think it's helpful, let other people know. Holy Father, Holy Father in heaven, we come before you and we come before Yeshua, Jesus, our Savior. And we just ask you in Jesus' name that you will hear this prayer. You'll pour out your Holy Spirit more so than ever before on your people. And you'll quicken our heart, quicken our minds to turn to you as never before, to repent where we need to repent. Study more, pray more, seek you more, overcome more. And help us know exactly how to handle the coming years. Provide for us, Father. There are people who can't afford to stock up. They can barely afford what they have now. Please work miracles in their lives and take care of them. The people in Kenya that we, we help out and, and others are helping out in other ways, other groups. Just please look after them too and all the poor of the world. The super poor right here in America. Father in heaven, we just hand this all over to you. We ask your blessing. We're coming up to the Sabbath now. And we ask your blessing and your dismissal. We praise you and we love you, Father. We love you, Yeshua. We love you. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others. <music>